Episode of Progress, Potential, and Possibilities, discussions with fascinating people designing a better tomorrow for all of us. I'm your host, Ira Pastor. Welcome, everybody, again to another episode of our show, bringing you another fascinating guest today involved in creating a better tomorrow. Uh, today, we have the honor of being joined by Dr. Namanje Bumpus, who is the United States FDA's chief scientist, uh, and her office has uh, very broad responsibilities in supporting the Research Foundation Science and innovation that ultimately underpins FDA's regulatory mission. Uh, and they accomplish this through a, a broad framework encompassing scientific collaborations, uh, technology transfer of FDA innovations to the private sector, scientific integrity and FDA policy uh, and decision making, uh, as well as the professional development of regulatory scientists and its core research component, the, uh, uh, the FDA's National Center for Toxicologic Research. Uh, before joining FDA, Dr. Bumpus was the uh, E.K. Marshall and Thomas H. Maren, professor and chair in the Department of Pharmacology and Molecular Sciences uh, at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine, where she served uh, previously as associate dean for basic research. Uh, and her research at Johns Hopkins focused, uh, again, on an array of topics, including drug metabolism, pharmacogenetics, bioanalytical chemistry, and infectious disease pharmacology. Uh, Dr. Bump has earned a bachelor's degree in biology at Occidental College, uh, her PhD in pharmacology, University of Michigan, and completed postdoc work in molecular and experimental medicine at Scripps uh, Research Institute in La Jolla. We're honored to have with us today, uh, Dr. Namanje Bumpus. Thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show. Thank you for having me. It, it's great having you. I, I would love to start off sort of going back to the beginning. And if you could sort of introduce us to yourself and a little bit about how your early sort of intellectual interest in biology, in chemistry, even in ecology, ultimately led to uh, your dissertation on the effects of a naturally occurring genetic polymorphism on the catalytic properties of human cytochrome P450 2B6. That was a long time ago. I almost didn't even remember that. These it's a cool science. title. <laughs> Thank you. So um, I've had an interest in science from a really young age for a really long time. So a lot of the things that, you know, especially now that I have young children of my own, I realize that make kids excited were things that excited me. So simple things like taking a bean, putting it in between two paper towels, adding water, and then watching it sprout. I mean, I thought that was really cool and would do lots of just household experiments. And so um, my parents essentially for holidays um, began to get me chemistry sets. So I remember getting a Smithsonian chemistry set working through the experiments and I really loved it. Just seeing these different chemicals you could mix together, learning about iron filings, I mean, all of these different things. So I, um, about mid elementary school, started thinking about, well, you know, what do chemists do? So I wrote a letter um, to the American Chemical Society and um, they sent me back brochures about careers that chemists have. And from ever since then I was hooked. I knew I would do something with science, something that involved chemistry and something where I would use my science to serve society. I think the things that really form the foundation for my approach to science, my interest in public health, and even you know my career in academia, where I really focused on you know trying to mentor and train the next generation of students, really come from my um, family background. So I'm the first person in my family to graduate from college, um, but I had a lot of support for becoming a scientist and working through this academic path. Um, my dad had been a professional boxer, and when mm -hmm. I was growing up, was um, a boxing coach, trained boxers. And I saw the care and the dedication that he put into his students. They were so important to him. A lot of them looked at him, they noted as a life coach in addition. So that love of teaching, I think, really sprung from seeing that. 
my mom at the same time worked in um, elementary school with uh, kids with special needs. And I saw that dedication to teaching. So I think I knew at my core, I also wanted to do something that had to deal with uh, developing other people. And so I've also really dedicated myself to developing other scientists. And I'll say the last thing, you know, we were really an activism type family, very involved in um, social justice and just trying to um, advance equity for our community. And so that's very much central to who I am. And so growing up, there was always this idea of, you know, not what will you be when you grow up, but what will you contribute when you grow mm -hmm. up through your life's work? And so I really thought about the fact that I love science, wanted to be a scientist, but in doing that, I felt the responsibility to do it in a way that was going to hopefully have some positive impact. So that's what really brought um, this focus on an interest in public health and health equity and all the things that I've worked on um, within the scientific space. Outstanding. Outstanding. And yeah, I mean, just the, as I mentioned in the intro, these are the purview of what uh, sort of is in front of you now as leading this office of science, uh, as mentioned, sort of, uh, and for those that sort of uh, may know the FDA and organizations within it, like CEDAR, where, you know, might, might go for drug development and meet with an oncology team or an immunology team. In your case, I mean, you have to know sort of everything across all these disease segments, plus uh, support the scientific development, the toxicology component. You, you're in charge of a counterterrorism and emerging threats office. Take us through what, what the Office of Science is all about and a little bit of the challenges and sort of staying ahead uh, of, of, of the curve in, in most of these areas. So the Office of the Chief Scientist, we really are focused, as you mentioned um, in the introduction, on um, supporting that scientific foundation that really cuts across the work that we do at FDA, the decisions that we make, really we have um, science underpinning that. And what people may not know is that in addition to the regulatory decisions made at FDA, you know, we are scientists here who are doing work that really informs those decisions. So we're making science-based decisions, not only um, based upon, you know, what's out there generally in the scientific community and, you know, the literature, but we generate scientific knowledge ourselves and are doing really leading and cutting edge experiments and um, research within what we call regulatory science space. So the Office of Chief Scientists, we try to forward that and provide that capability and support scientists, advocate for scientists, advocate for resources, build connections between our scientists to really enable that work. So as part of our group, we have the National Center for Toxicological Research, mm -hmm. and this is in Jefferson, Arkansas. And it is a crucial component of FDA in that they are really focused on this research we're talking about. They do you know, laboratory research, they do bioinformatics and silico type research, but they are really generating vital data that's required for our regulatory decision making and for development of sound regulatory policy. In addition, we have lots of other offices too that are critical. So we have the Office of Regulatory Science and Innovation that has many functions and all these groups have more functions than I'll be able to describe. But a key thing that they really do is coordinate our groups that are really experts in certain areas of science, bring people together to make connections across mm -hmm. the centers around certain areas of science to get you know really agency-wide discussion. They also fund research both internally and externally. So they fund projects here. Our scientists have ideas of excellent work they'd like to do. There are opportunities for funding. Um, externally, we also have centers of excellence in regulatory science and innovation, and those are um, coordinated through this office. You mentioned our Office of Counterterrorism and Emerging Threats. That group really focuses on emergency preparedness and has a lot mm -hmm. of expertise there. We have a tech transfer program. So yeah. as I said, people may not realize that we do our own original science. As part of that, we make discoveries. So we actually do discover technologies and they can be licensed for development um, by other parties, other entities. So we have um, contributions that we're making to the scientific enterprise, even through novel discoveries that are then licensed and developed by others. Um, you know, we cover laboratory safety scientific integrity and professional development of scientists, and even the advisory committee oversight and management staff that does um, a lot of the work to really oversee the process of our advisory committees and manage that. So we have a broad range, as you noted, of things that we do, but at the foundation is really enabling our science, supporting our science, um, and advocating for our scientists. Excellent. 
Yeah, yeah. And then, you know, just a couple months ago, we related to that, your team released the um, uh, 2022 report, Advancing Regulatory Science at FDA, and we'll put a link to that uh, in the bio of the show. And you focus, you know, these these sort of these four extremely comprehensive uh, core focus areas. And I thought it'd be interesting to drill down on some of these and, and sort of connect it to some of your work. Um, you know, there's uh, one part of this report uh, entitled Increasing Choice and Competition Through Innovation. Uh, and one of the core topics here, which has been extremely hot for us on the show, is the, is the topic precision medicine, individualized medicine. Uh, and then, of course, the the interesting tools to understand disease, but also patient heterogeneity. Um, I was interesting that you know your team at Hopkins recently published this paper, uh, achieving a deeper understanding of drug metabolism responses using single cell technologies. And again, sort of the theme in that paper was all about you know what are the tools we need to enhance our personalized medicine progress. Talk a little bit about uh, sort of this area and a little bit of how you see the tools evolving in the uh, uh, personalized space versus a sort of the more conventional sort of approach that we used in the past. Yes, as a scientist, um, I've spent my career really focused on understanding heterogeneity in response um, to drugs and trying to figure out how we can better predict what responses might be. And so one thing that we um, did a lot of work in was really looking at pharmacogenetics that you mentioned yep. earlier. So, um, you know, how genetic differences in certain instances can influence a response um, to a medicine, for instance. So we did work trying to understand those mechanisms and the biochemistry there, understanding how genetics influence how people process drugs differently. Right you're processing a drug differently, what we call it drug metabolism, right. then your overall levels of the drug that's circulating in your body, you know, could be different based on your genetics. So we did a lot of work trying to sort that out. Um, in addition, we, as you mentioned, really started to drill down into single cell biology, which I think is an exciting um, next frontier. It's a very nascent field, but it's a very exciting area of science. And we have work going on in that area at FDA. And, you know, worldwide, there are people moving this forward, but really this idea of can we get to a place of understanding even heterogeneity between cells, how yeah. cells in the same population may respond differently to some stimuli or, you know, some disease state, and how can we understand that and then leverage that potentially um, in the decisions that we're making about, you um, you know, things to target, for instance, or um, how to deliver certain products. So it's a very nascent area that I think is very scientifically interesting. There's a lot of work to do in that field before it can be used for anything yep. um, as far as translationally, but from a basic biochemistry, biology, pharmacology, I think that it's a place where there's a lot of um, interest and a lot of value in exploring scientifically. Mm -hmm. Um, in, in this section, uh, cross-cutting topics, there's a part um, about minority health and health equity regulatory science research. Um, and you, in, within that is uh, something called the FDA's Office of Minority Health and Health Equity. Um, it was interesting, also, you know, I, I, I came across your paper, it was uh, in science back in 2021 about basically for better drugs, we needed to diversify clinical trials. And I thought there was a, a really interesting piece um, looking back at your dissertation now, uh, and I, I make sure I have the term right, you, you, were, you were talking in your dissertation about the uh, something called the K26R mutation that, you know, has this very high frequency, 50% mutation in, in Ghanaian population, 30% in Taiwanese and Japanese. Um, talk a little bit about this component of sort of our, our once again, our pharmacotoxicogenetic understanding, and then what the Office of Minority Health and Health Equity is all about. Well, the Office of Minority Health and Health Equity, um, you know, they're certainly a collaborator office with us, and people should check out their website. They really do fantastic work, I think, helping folks to think through um, health equity issues and the ways that we can all really work together to advance health equity and to think about that. And they have some great resources around clinical trial diversity. So I would, you know, encourage folks to look at the work they're doing. They're really great colleagues for us. Um, from my work in kind of the biochemistry, molecular biology, molecular pharmacology space, certainly 
we're thinking about, you know, pharmacogenetics, we thought about those genetic differences and the fact that there can be differences in prevalence of certain um, genetic variants in different populations. And this is specifically, mm -hmm. though, we're thinking about in the context of drug processing, again, how people process drugs, metabolize drugs, um, that there can be differences genetically that may influence that. And in certain instances, there are differences in um, the distribution of those variants across populations. So something we think about from that lens, I think generally, to fully understand biology, to just understand, you know, human beings as an organism to the best of our ability, we want to make sure that we are considering really the full range of biology. Right. So whether we're doing um, kind of preclinical experiments, clinical, whatever it is, just thinking about, um, you know, how can we make this open and accessible to as many people as possible so that we get the full range of understanding of biology. Excellent. In, in the report section, um, Unleashing the Power of Data, um, there's a, a wide range of tools that you're looking at in terms of artificial intelligence and digital health. And then I came across, a, this was a New York Times article that you were featured in, entitled Clinical Trials Moving Out of the Lab into People's Homes. It was talking about a uh, sort of, a, of the HIV ten, tenof, tenofovir uh, study uh, that had to be delayed due to COVID. Um, Talk a little bit about sort of the the digital side of things here, because, you know, these digital tools are not just obviously used now for clinical development, real world evidence, but also some of them are therapeutics in their own right. I think FDA approved a video game maybe a year ago or so. Um, talk a little bit about sort of the, the digital side of things at FDA, if you would. I think there's a lot of opportunity. Um, that work is really led, um, you know, within our centers, um, potential, uh, particularly CDRH. From the Office of the Chief Scientist side of things, it's really just working to bring folks together in ways that would be useful and advance that knowledge. So we do have working groups, you know, in some of those spaces like AI, for instance, and within the National Center for Toxicological Research that we discussed earlier, there are um, efforts in AI and bioinformatics that touch upon determining and really trying to develop ways to leverage AI to understand some of these scientific questions that we're interested in. So we talked about pharmacogenetics. Well, yeah. are there AI-based approaches that could be used to try to better predict what outcomes might be, to better understand what even the frequency of variants might be? So it's a growing area. There's a lot to do in that space. And we're really excited about how we can bring folks together for discussion on that and also within our laboratories advance some of these areas of interest, you know, such as AI and um, pharmacology and toxicology and other areas. Awesome. Awesome. Um, we talked about countermeasures and, and, and the preparedness uh, office a bit. Um, uh, about a Several months ago, we had um, uh, Colonel Victor Suarez on. He was uh, with the US, U.S. Army, but he was involved with the Operation Warp Speed, uh, talking a little about things from that side. Um, and in this section, uh, you know, you, there the report talks about um, tools, the biomarkers, the organoids, uh, ways to sort of uh, modify or sort of modulate, replace, reduce, and refine um, animal testing. And, you know, obviously, it's been a very interesting world the last couple of years and FDA probably more than ever before has had to you know, think about this emer um, emergency use dynamic, probably changes the way you work there a lot. Um, talk a little bit about sort of that component of, of the work. And then also the report mentioned something called the laboratory flexible funding model, uh, specifically focusing on these complex public health events. Can you explain what that's all about? Well, I think, um, you know, I can focus on that first piece. There's certainly a lot in there, but I think that first piece, um, especially when you were talking about, you know, kind of this reducing, replacing, refining the use of animals, we have, um, you know, work that we're doing around what we call alternative methods. So these are laboratory-based approaches that are developed that could, in certain instances, potentially um, you know, be used as a replacement of animal studies or to refine animal studies that may be performed in a certain context. And one of the areas that's really interesting around this, you mentioned organo organoids. So mm -hmm. these, you know, microphysiological systems where we really can try to recapitulate what we might see in a response as far as an organ or even an organism potentially through an in vitro, say, cell-based method. So we're doing work around um, organs on a chip, where, mm -hmm. for instance, you can take 
hepatocytes, which are liver cells, yep. and um, culture them in a way that they're on these, you know, small chips and perform experiments there, perform, you know, a treatment, give them a stimuli, and then test whether they respond the same way that you would expect them to in their kind of, uh, you know, natural setting within a liver. So we're doing a lot of that work in various organs. We're looking in, you know, brain and liver and other places and really trying to understand how we can scientifically optimize these methods and determine whether there are opportunities to use them to understand certain outcomes um, from certain products and certain um, stimuli in general. So there is a lot of work in that area and something that we're really excited about. Um, I had the opportunity to watch a um, an interview that you gave with, at the time, the, the chief executive officer of Johns Hopkins Medicine, and you were talking about uh, your lab at the time sort of making the transition from, you know, heavily focusing on small molecules into the biologic space. Um, but there's other there's other interesting therapeutics out there now. And there's several sections on this in the report. And when we get into things like microbiome cocktails, phage, uh, some of the regenerative medicine products, uh, we're not dealing with straight biologics anymore. We're dealing with really complex uh, mixtures. I'm just interested on, you know, once again, as the head of science and, you know, thinking about uh, the broad spectrum of pharmacology, kinetics, pharmacodynamics and so forth. Talk a little bit about sort of these combination, sort of I'll call it messy products, and, and how sort of they fit in nowadays. Because you know they're they're there and they're very unique compared to sort of the single molecular entities that we're used to. So you know we have experts within our centers who I think are thinking about all of these issues a lot and have a lot of understanding of you know what are the considerations for various products for safety and effectiveness and you know, trying to understand what, you know, how things might interact with one another. For me, in thinking about kind of the scientific space of things, I mean, certainly we have research around, you know, larger molecules as well, like you were mm -hmm. referring to, but also just coordinating our communication in the way that we think about some of these things and what are the scientific needs to be able to have greater understanding of them. So I think all of these areas are really emerging, but we will continue to play a role in helping to understand what are the scientific areas that need to be advanced to um, you know, have greater understanding of these types of products and you know, providing whatever support we can to the centers as they're doing their work. But um, the expertise as far as, you know, the products and kind of how they might work together and interact is really within our centers. And we play a role in supporting um, their science, however they might mm -hmm. need us to. What, what what areas of pharmacotherapeutic development, you know, for you, you know, what are you, what are you personally excited about looking out? I and mean, obviously you see a, a broad basket of, uh, of uh, pharmacotherapeutic interventions that come to FDA. What what gets you excited in terms of of where we are? Is it mRNA? Is it gene therapies? What 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 do you think about when you when you're not thinking about the stuff you're working on inside? Yeah, so I think um, I think about it even a little a little bit more broadly and step back. And so when I'm excited, like I said I'm a I'm a basic scientist, and so I really get excited. Mo I think most and in many ways about the fundamental broader question. So so this idea of um, can we develop an in vitro method that in some instance can predict what we might expect to see in a person, in a human? I mean, that's mm -hmm. really exciting to me. And I think that we're certainly far from being able to do that broadly, but there are opportunities and advancements in technology, including AI, where we'll be able to, I think, more effectively make those predictions. So I'm really excited about that. I'm also really excited about, as I mentioned, this emerging field of single cell biology and understanding how we can really bring that knowledge and bring those technologies to bear in a way that really does inform precision medicine. I think right now it's nascent. So mm -hmm. we're focusing on the, the techniques, the equipment, how do you actually isolate a single cell and know you just got one cell? Um, you know, the bioinformatic tools needed because you get a huge amount of data. So we're at that place, but how can we use it and translate it to something that informs precision or personalized medicine? We're a ways away from that, but I think that, you know, that really excites me. And also this idea of, you know, diversification of, um, 
you know, clinical trials, but even I say preclinical um, studies as well, as far as the way that we're thinking about things. I'm very enthusiastic and excited about the opportunity to understand more of the range of biological responses, more of the range of genetic differences that we can see in drug processing specifically, or even in certain drug targets or immune responses. I think that with AI technology, with um, you know computational pharmacology, and with even greater lab abilities that we have now, that there's a real opportunity to substantially increase just our understanding of genetics. So I'm very interested in um, all of those areas. And and how about um, combinations? I know FDA has um, in recent years uh, released some some guidance on combination therapies. Um, I, I remember actually in uh, coming back to your dissertation again, you know, one of the one of the drugs you study was um, efavirenz, which you mentioned is, you know, it's this important reverse transcript disinhibitor, but we have to think of it in the context of of the, the triple therapies and so forth. And, you know, have made amazing progress. Um, combinations always come with that, you know, um, extra baggage in the sense, you know, if, if one product, if, if there's one compound that's doing X and something else is affecting the pharmacokinetics of that, how we study these, and I'm just interested in sort of your thoughts on uh, where we're going, because obviously combinations have done amazing things for HIV, cancer as well, maybe hasn't, this poly polypharmacy concept maybe hasn't uh, gone as broad with other diseases, but but say a couple words about combinations and in, uh, in the context of everything. Yeah, so I think I can, you know, speak just as a pharmacologist and kind of the yeah. general principles Please. of pharmacology and that certainly... Um, you know, combinations of things, you can have more efficacy or effectiveness because you're, you know, potentially hitting something in multiple ways. You gave the example of HIV. And so you can use, you know, different classes of drugs to hit different places and, you know, of the virus, basically different parts of the virus. And that's what we've seen, you know, over the years with the development of those combination therapies. I think also there are opportunities to leverage combinations to um, even improve the pharmacokinetics of a co-administered drug. And so, you know, that's a possibility with understanding of drug metabolism. There are certainly, you know, certain contexts for all of these things in certain situations, but I think that those are pretty well embedded now in just the principles of pharmacology that um, combinations can have all of those benefits. I mean, you mentioned it can make interpretation potentially more difficult, but I think that for many of these, um, you know, there are understanding of basic mechanisms that we can leverage and use the combinations to our advantage, you know, pharmacologically. Excellent. Thank you for that. I appreciate you sharing that uh, that insight. Um, Dr. Mumbus, I I, uh, I saw that you know you were elected to the National Academy of Medicine uh, back in 2022, and and um, somebody I had the honor of of interviewing was uh, Dr. Victor Zhao, uh, CEO of the uh, of the National Academies, and and one of the things that we talked about was the the longevity uh, grand challenge that they have, and you know it, in the sort of longevity biotechnology community nowadays, there's this debate going on about uh, aging uh, and whether it should or should not be classified on its own as a disease, sort of upstream from many of these chronic diseases. I just, you know, be interested when it, when it comes to, um, well, I'd love to hear your thoughts on longevity and aging in general, but uh, when it comes to sort of the, these new, uh, entirely new sort of um, disease classes, let's say, um, if you're seeing any, I, I don't know how often it happens, uh, you know, maybe pre-diabetes didn't exist, you know, 15 years ago, and now it exists and so forth. Um, any interesting thoughts on, on, on that? And, and specifically, as we talk about sort of the topic of aging a lot on the show, um, whether you see any movement per the scientific group um, on this theme? So I think scientifically, to me, um, you know, aging is a very interesting topic that I think is still a bit understudied, um, yeah. especially given that it's something that, you know, I experience, right? We're all experiencing aging and I hope to continue to experience. So um, I think there's more work to be done there, certainly. Um, you know, there are changes with biology, even at the cellular level that you'll see with age. And I think that there's a lot we still don't understand um, in the context, for instance, in pharmacology of how some of these drug metabolizing enzymes that we talked about might change with age, mm -hmm. um, how certain proteins biochemically might be modified with age. I think there's a lot of basic 
molecular pharmacology, molecular biology to be done around aging, and that it's something that's important to do. And certainly, um, you know, as we're thinking about study design and the scientific community, I do think there's value in um, in looking at the impact of age across the lifespan. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. older individuals, certainly, but really thinking across the lifespan, even, you know, and younger people or animals or whatever you're doing in your study. So mm -hmm. um, looking across the lifespan, I think more generally in the work that we do certainly will advance our understanding of these biological concepts. Excellent. Excellent. Um, just coming back to, um, you know, one of the things I noticed in um, one of your bios was that a long time ago when you were doing your your um, your bachelor's work, before you were doing sort of human biology work, you were involved in plant research. Um, and I was just, you know, obviously we're talking, you know, you're at the FDA, we're talking a lot about the D part here. Um, what What's exciting in the Office of Science in terms of the F and food? Because... Um, Obviously, you, while you oversee the gene therapies and the immuno oncology products, you have to make sure our foods are not adulterated, and you know, keeping up the speed on on all those technological advances, uh, and a lot of the same tools apply. Anything exciting happening in the uh, the office of science per food that you might want to mention? Well, our you know colleagues who are focused. Um you know, on food and working in that area do really exceptional, exciting science. And they there's a lot of overlap in the techniques that we use across these various areas. And yeah. so I think one thing that's been pretty cool is we're talking about these alternative methods and developing things like these organs on a chip. Yeah. Um, some of our leaders in that area are people who work within our foods program um, because they're interested in understanding what the response to certain components of food might be, for instance. So, you know, there's a lot of great science here at the agency, and it's done really across the board, across areas. And there's so much opportunity for us to, you know, bridge and continue to work together and collaborate. And my office is really um, excited to identify those opportunities and pretend, continue to augment and enhance them. Wonderful. Um, coming back to um, sort of the beginning where we started off, um, you know, obviously you uh, you've been on an amazing journey here. You know, you talked about mentorship and, and inspiring the next generation. Your, your talk has been very ins inspiring today. But for the the next generation of STEM thought leaders that that may be listening to our show, um, any other advice you want to impart uh, per your career? And then, are there any interesting sort of STEM related uh, initiatives at FDA per that next generation that may sort of be in that stage of heading off to college, not exactly knowing what they're doing yet, but um, FDA sounds cool. Yeah, FDA is cool. And it's a great place to do science. I really encourage people who are interested in the scientific career um, to consider FDA. I think we have a lot of opportunities and we have internships that people can undertake and participate and come here and do research or work within an office. We have many people who do postdoctoral fellowships here as well within our laboratories or within you know the centers and offices. So I think that no matter where someone is in their career stage, that they should be looking to us as a place where they can do great science and have a very direct effect on public health. As far as you know, my message for the next generation or how I think about the next generation, you know, one thing that's always been important to me is making sure that folks understand, you know, scientists are come from a range of different backgrounds. There's not some mold you have to fit in to be a scientist. I think that there are, you know, sometimes some ideas about what a scientist looks like or, you know, what their, you know, favorite subject was in school or, you know, what background they come from, what college or university they must have gone to, whatever it is. And I've met people with all types of backgrounds. I mean, I have a friend that was a professional musician for years and then went um, to graduate school for science, you know, decades into, you know, being a career, an adult with a career, basically. So kind of a non-traditional path and is really, you know, leading in science. And with me, like I said, I was the first person in my family to graduate from college. And um, there was no straight path to, you know, okay, well, this is what you do to become a scientist, get a PhD. I was figuring it out as I went and identifying people to encourage me and trying to research the next step and get that information. So you can come from, you know, any setting and there's an opportunity. If you love science, it's an opportunity for you. And the other thing I would say is that 
you know, if this is what you want to do and you feel science the way that you want to contribute, then that's something to stick to. Mm -hmm. There's often a lot of discouragement in any field when you're coming along. There's a lot of, if you're not like this, you won't make it. If you don't achieve this, you won't make it. There's a lot of discouragement. And I always say, I feel that students especially often get more discouragement than they do encouragement. And the range of encouragement they get often is not as great as their actual ability. And it's unfortunate. So I think it's really staying true to if this is what you want to do, you can do it and not internalizing other people's biases about what it takes to be a scientist. You can identify people who will support you and mentor you and be honest with you about where you need to develop. But instead of saying something you can't do, they'll be looking towards growth. But this is how I can help you get here. So, you know, this is something you can come from any background and do if you want it and you love it. It's something I would say to really pursue. And along the way, you will find people who will support you on that path. And FDA is a great place to do science. <laughs> Those are my <laughs> messages. <laughs> excellent, excellent messages. Uh, Dr. Mobis, one last thing while we have you. I noticed that um, coming up next month, you're going to be presenting uh, at the uh, the Stanford uh, Drug Discovery Symposium in April. Uh, I think you were just at the Arkansas Bioinformatics Consortia. Any other uh, upcoming public facing uh, things that you're going to be involved in, places where we can meet you, possibly listen to you, uh, anything else you want to uh, feature per the public facing aspect of, of your work, please? So I think that's primarily what's on the you know calendar now, even though, of course, you know I'm open to communicating science. It's a real priority of mine and certainly a priority that, of the agency to make sure that we're communicating um, robust information about science and really trying to deal with mis and disinformation about science that we know is, you know, out there and, you know, ample abundance. And it's something that's really key to us as an agency to deal with that and try to make sure that people have, um, you know, reliable information and really access to information about the best science. So communication is a priority to me, making sure that we're communicating it to everyone that, you know, needs access, that we're thinking about, you um, you know, diverse groups of people that we're thinking about, um, you know, diverse ways to convey our information. So I'm always open to talking science and it's really a priority to me to make sure that I'm part of doing that and, you know, getting that information out to the public. Outstanding. Really outstanding. Um, for everybody that is going to be listening to this particular episode of our show across the various podcast networks, or again, watching on the YouTube channel, uh, you've been listening to Dr. Namanje Bumpus, United States Food and Drug Administration Chief Scientist, doing really amazing things on the research, science, and innovation front uh, that ultimately underpins the FDA's uh, mission. Uh, Dr. Bumpus, I want to thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come talk to us and educate us on these topics for a little while. Obviously, thank you for everything you're doing to keep our food and drugs safe. And as we like to say on our show here, thanks for helping to create a better tomorrow for so many people out there via what you do. Really great story. Thank you for having me.